Hi everyone, I'm Susan from World Peaceful and as promised in some of my previous videos I want to discuss pole shift and axis shift in this video. I'm going to start with um, pole shift. So I've gone to National Geographic and the article I'm actually having a look at is climate change is moving the North Pole. As ice melts and aquifers are drained, Earth's distribution of mass is changing and with it, position of the planet's spin axis. This article is by Brian Clark Howard and they've just got a picture uh, which is about the collapse of the uh, Antarctica's Larsen B ice shelf in 2002. It's just one example of shrinking glaciers around the world, a process that is changing the planet's mass distribution. And he says, Finding the North Pole means travelling north, right? Yes, but with a slight caveat. Earth's northern pole is drifting, drifting rapidly eastward, and it looks like climate change is to blame, they say. The discovery may have major implications for studies of ice loss and drought, potentially improving our ability to predict such changes in the future. Earth turns around an axis like a giant spinning top. The places where that invisible axis intersects with the planet's surface are the north and south rotational poles. Due to Earth's wobble on its axis, these spots drift in roughly decade-long cycles. And they've got in brackets, all this motion is a completely separate mechanism from the behaviour of the planet's magnetic poles, which also reverse periodically over the course of millions of years. They go on to say, Scientists pinpoint the geographic north and south poles by taking the long-term averages of those rotational positions. Explorers and scientists have been reliably measuring the precise positions of the rotational poles since 1899, first by measuring the relative positions of the stars and then by using satellite telemetry. Over the past century or so, the poles have tended to wander by just a few centimetres a year. That may seem like a tiny variation, but there is very important information embedded in that, says Surinder Adhikari, an Earth scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. The North Pole has shifted back and forth from east to west with an overall trend that had it moving towards Canada. But since 2000, the pole's typical drift has made a dramatic change, says Adhikari. Since that time, the pole has been moving steadily eastward by about 75 degrees, heading toward the prime meridian that runs through Greenwich in England. The shift has been on the order of 10 centimetres a year. So it's probably not enough to warrant a recalculation of the planet's geographic pole. Although later generations may have to consider, consider it if things keep changing. Notes at Hikari. What's most exciting to the scientists is that they can now explain what's actually causing the drift. And that may have significant ramifications on climate science ebb and flow. For at least a decade, scientists have suspected that the massive amounts of melting taking place in glaciers around the world could significantly redistribute mass on Earth. That's particularly true when it comes to the huge ice sheets over Greenland and in Western Antarctica. If ice disappears from one part of the spinning Earth and resettles elsewhere as water, the planet shifts on its axis towards the place where, the lost, where it lost mass. 
but the physics are so complex that scientists could only guess at how this actually works in the real world. Now, Ad Hikari has proposed a way to explain the process. The secret was discovering that it's not just shrinking glaciers that change Earth's mass distribution, as some scientists have thought. A lot of mass also gets moved around due to large-scale loss of liquid water from the land. The team reports this week in Science Advances. Adhikari and his colleagues and co-author Eric Ivans think the rotational pole is shifting towards Europe because there has been a massive loss of water from lakes and aquifers in Eurasia around the Caspian Sea and in India. Warmer temperatures overall have led to more evaporation and less precipitation in many areas. And booming human populations have been sucking up groundwater from reservoirs and wells. And I have in brackets watch Saudi Arabia get drained dry. In quotes, what we have shown is that melting ice and a pattern of continental water storage are combining to cause a dramatic shift in the direction of the pole, says Adekari. Gavin Schmidt, a climate scientist with NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, commends the authors for adding to the discussion about climate science. Schmidt, who is not affiliated with the study, agrees that human activity has caused detectable shifts in mass from ice sheet smelt and groundwater extraction. heading poll predictions. Adhikari and Ivans hope their findings will help other climate researchers improve our understanding of global forces. In, in quote, we should be able to use polar motion data to answer some interesting questions, says Adhikari. The data could help make climate models more accurate because scientists could work backwards from the Ropast archive on polar drift to infer the melting and evaporation rates of the past. We have much better data on the position of the poles than we do on melting glaciers through history, Adhikari notes. Scientists might similarly be able to track how far specific areas have dried out from drought. The end result could be more accurate predictions of changes in climate in the future, as well as better understandings of how our planet spins through space. So that's an article taken from National Geographic called Climate Changes Moving the North Pole. So that's one to have a, a contemplation about. I'm going to look at another article which caught my attention. And it's called, Why is Earth's Axis Shifting? You might find this very interesting. And this is from Cosmos, so cosmosmagazine.com. Humanity has now burned enough fossil fuel to tip the planet slightly, Carl Kruselnicki explains. I love these names. There's a picture of the Earth here. It's an incredible thing to, to think that we all live on a sphere really interesting too when you see pictures of the earth and they've got the lights glowing. I remember when I flew over India I could see all the you know the lights from below and some were fires and you know it's so interesting when you fly into countries and you see all the lights from the sky. I often think about coal burning when I look over it. Even when I'm in cities I'm always looking at the lights, how much we waste. It's always amazing to me. We're just unconscious. We don't realise the deep connection. Anyway, the article says we are only a little way into the 21st century, but signs of warming the planet are already evident around the globe. More frequent droughts in East Africa, stranded polar bears in the Arctic, bleached coral reefs in the tropics, and retreating glaciers in the high latitudes. Along the coasts, sea levels are rising. 
I might just add in here that I remember when I was up in the Himalayas, the Western, Western Himalayas, was learning about some of the tribal people that were living up in the very high reaches of the Himalayas, experiencing drought and the ice, you know, it was melting at, at different periods and they were not able to get the water back. And of course the Himalayas supplies the whole you know, south, uh, the whole of India. So that continent is supplied by the upper reaches of the Himalayas. I thought very deeply about that when I was there. Anyway, to the article. So they've just talked about the bleaching coral reefs, the polar bears, the retreating glaciers, etc. Even so, a new study really surprised me. By burning huge quantities of fossil fuels, we humans have tipped the earth off its axis by a tiny amount. Let me emphasize how tiny the tipping is. Each year since 2005, we have shifted the spin axis from its previous path by centimetres, not kilometres. The north-south spin axis of the Earth runs through the North Geographical Pole in the Arctic Ocean and the South Geographical Pole in Antarctic. This person's just making it clear, they're not talking about the magnetic North and South Poles, just geographical poles. So these are the poles uh, run through from north to south on an angle. If you look on Google, you'll see what it looks like. So in effect, there's two north, two south poles. One's magnetic, one's geographical. He goes on to say, but as the Earth spins on its own axis, the position of the North Pole is not dead true. It wobbles a little for several reasons. For one, the Earth is not perfectly spherical. I didn't know that. Instead, it's a bit flattened at the poles and a bit bulging at the equator. And the surface is not smooth. It's pretty bumpy. <laughs> Mountains poke up towards space while oceans dip down into the solid crust. Our planet is not perfectly rigid either. It's somewhat elastic. Yes, it does have a solid crust at the surface, but it's very thin. Earth is made mostly of molten rock and then liquid iron with a core of solid iron. Interesting, isn't it? And that's why the, the man magnetics are affected by that solid iron core. Magma. So even today, parts of the crust that carry heavy ice sheets 20,000 years ago are still slowly rising an effect known as the isostatic rebound or post-glacial rebound. As a result of these and other factors, when Earth rotates on its own axis over the course of a day, that spin axis wobbles a little. Interesting, isn't it? Most people would think that the world was just revolving and not wobbling, but it's actually wobbling. There's a lot of individual wobbles. A major one is the so-called Chandler wobble, which American astronomer Seth Carlo Chandler discovered in 1891. During a period of slightly more than a year, about 433 days, the Chandler wobble shifts the North Pole over a rough circle or ellipse, about several meters across. About two thirds of the Chandler wobble seems to be caused by ocean currents and about one third by winds in the Earth's atmosphere. Isn't that interesting, the currents and the winds, that movement above and below. It's really fascinating. So that's the wobble. Now he's got in big print, it's hard to imagine something as small as we humans being able to shift something as massive as our whole planet, he says, although I, I don't think it's that hard to believe personally, given technology. But he's just, I guess, in awe of the size of the earth. From 1982 to 2005, scientists found that the North Pole was drifting slowly south towards Labrador, about six to seven centimetres each year. But in 2005, the motions of the North Pole suddenly flipped in three unexpected ways. 
First, the North Pole chucked a lefty, <laughs> I like that, and started heading east, parallel to the equator. It's still heading east. Second, the North Pole more than tripled its drift speed to about 24 or so centimetres a year. It's still drifting at this speed. Third, the Chandler wobble changed phase, and so far scientists have no explanation for why. But they do have a good answer for the tipping of the spin axis. Rapid melting of ice on land had made the drift velocity of the North Pole accelerate and has changed its direction of travel to the east. Solid ice is now liquid water spread across the planet. We know where the ice was, we know where it's gone, and the maths all fit with the observed changes to motions of the North Pole. Since the mid-1900s, we've used satellites to accurately measure these land ice changes many tens of millions of times. Recent analysis shows that between 2011 and 2014, Greenland, Antarctica and mountain glaciers were losing about 600 billion tonnes of ice per year. I want to repeat that because in actual fact, when I first found this article, I was on my phone. And that figure jumped out at me, which is why I found this article again on my computer, because I found that very interesting. I'm going to read it again. Recent analysis shows that between 2011 and 2014, Greenland, Antarctica and mountain glaciers were losing about 600 billion tonnes of ice per year. See, I'm wondering about the 600 billion barrels of oil per year. I'm, I was going to mention that to you after I finish reading because I see a weight displacement there as well. I've got a blog on it if you want to look at my, um, my blogs, Pieces Out Through Nature. Anyway, back to the article. Now, this is 600 billion tonnes of ice per year. Most of the ice came from Greenland. This was an increase of two or three times the loss rate between 2003 and 2009. Now with Greenland, let's have a look at Greenland. I'm just going to type in Greenland. Um, it's just something I feel to have a look for. Um, just got to look a little bit more. Because with this mice, uh, melting ice, yeah, what I was interested in was the peat bogs shed new light on Greenland pollution. This is a physics. I'm just going to quickly, I'm just doing an interlude. This is an edit. You, you imagine I'm just inserting into this article, okay? <laughs> this is not the article. This is actually from physics.org. I'm just doing a bit of lateral thinking as I'm going through the article. That's the way I am. Scientists from the University of Aberdeen have provided the strongest evidence yet that the origin of atmospheric lead pollution in Greenland after studying a peat bog on the southern tip of the island. So it's lead pollution. That's interesting. We're doing core samples um, from a bog in Sandhaven near Cape Farewell in southern Greenland. It's revealed the pollution is most likely to have come from North America and not Europe. So what I, the reason I'm going here is because when the ice melts, the peat bogs are no longer protected and we end up with more um, CO2 emissions from the peat because it's, it's stored in the, the, the methane escapes. So that's why I went there. I'm just going to go back to the article now. I just That was just a, a feeling to go there. But I encourage you to check out Greenland because that's, that's a massive um, tipping point. Okay, so it's hard to imagine something as small as we humans being able to shift something as massive as a whole planet. But we used global warming as a force multiplier. We dumped billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere hitting it along with the oceans. 
combination of hotter atmosphere and ocean water then melted over half a trillion tonnes of ice, which flowed into the oceans. This redistribution of water shifted the north-south spin axis. So there's your connection between CO2 and um, ice melt and weight distribution and axis spin and shift. Why did both the Chandler wobble and the spin axis shift suddenly instead of gradually? We don't know yet. Perhaps it's like slowly pushing a pencil towards the edge of a table. You push and you push and you push and it's still on the table. But then you give it just one more tiny push. The table is no longer supporting its centre of gravity and it suddenly falls to the floor. That sort of suggests that gradual change can lead to sudden shifts. So that's kind of interesting. That's um, an article I've just wanted to tap into from Cosmos. Why is the Earth's axis shifting? Now I'm just going to quickly have a look at how many billions of barrels of oil. So um, total, let's have a look at total oil. Total oil barrels worldwide. Just curious to see what comes up. 2016, the International Energy Agency, I'm just looking at an acronym here, oil market report forecasts worldwide average demand of nearly 96 million barrels of oil and liquid fuels per day. This is per day. Those figures that were quoted were, I think, per year. I'm just going to go back. Well, they talked about the um, half a trillion tonnes of ice flowing into oceans due to CO2. And they talked about the 600 billion tonnes of ice per year. So total oil is per day. So it's 35 billion barrels a year. The reason I did the blog on oil was that I had inspiration around it. I, I felt that because we were transforming a heavy weighted oil into gas, that's got to have an impact on the weight distribution around the planet, given it's been extracted, you know, from reservoirs under the oil under the earth's surface, right around the world. Middle East, Russia, um, Northwest. Uh, England, the United States has oil reserves, so you can pretty much scan across the world to have a look. You can actually Google it um, where the oil reserves are on geographically. Um, might even it might even tell me if I have a quick look. Oil, oil reserves are geographically worldwide. Let's see interesting to have a look at a map. See if it gives me a map. Or whether it's going to take me somewhere else. It's taking me somewhere else. That's funny. Geographic distribution of oil and natural gas deposits. That's one. Petroleum world distribution of oil. Our Middle, Middle East contains more than 50% of the world's proven reserves but accounts for only 30% of global oil. I was just reading. This is Encyclopedia Britannica as a source. So petroleum is not distributed evenly around the world. More than half of the world's proven oil reserves are located in the Middle East, as I said, including Iran, but not North Africa. That is to say the Middle East contains more oil than the rest of the world combined. Isn't that interesting? That suggests it's the oldest part of the earth because it would have originally been um, flora that broke down and over millions of years became oil. 
Following the Middle East are Canada and the United States, Latin America, Africa, and the region occupied by the former Soviet Union. Each of those regions contains less than 15% of the world's proven reserves. So they're in place petroleum is what they're calling reserves that are considered recoverable under econ current economic and technological conditions. So the Middle East, as said before, contains more than 50% of the world's proven reserves that accounts for only 30% of global oil production, though this figure is still higher than in any other region. The United States, by contrast, lays claim to less than 2% of the world's proven reserves, but produces about 10% of the world's oil. And that's why we have energy wars around the world, is, is given uh, industry needs the oil to function. Although free energy, in my opinion, would be a solution to that. And Nikola Tesla created free energy. It was JP Morgan who patented and shelved it because it wasn't um, meterable. In other words, you couldn't charge for it because it's free. So that whole issue with oil um, and money, economics, is where we're out of balance with the natural systems of the earth. And harking back to the axis, shift. It's that weight distribution. And then, of course, we've got the pole shift issue too, which is a make, uh, when I was talking about climate changes moving north, the North Pole, that was a ge geographical pole. But now I want to talk a little bit about um, actually the magnetic pole, if I can, if I can find something on that. Yeah, they're, they're definitely reinforcing the idea of the melting ice shifts, um, shifting the axis. What I might do is just actually talk from some notes that I wrote a little bit earlier. I actually had a look at David Suzuki's um, footage from one of his films on the polar reversal or pole shift, they call it. But what's of interest is the magnetic poles. That's the part I'm interested in the most. And I, I've definitely felt inspiration around checking out the magnetic poles. Um, I'll just, just want to see if there's something of interest this article that I pulled up before, which was to do with the Earth spin and the axis shift. It's very interesting. The world is very complicated. Now, I might just go from my notes. Magnetic, uh, this is the magnetic poles, north and south. They say it's moving towards Siberia. Now, in terms of the magnetic poles, they, they actually fluctuate. So if you can imagine the axis, north, south axis, well, the magnetic would be shifting a lot because it's magnetic, it's a magnetic pole that's affected by the iron core in the Earth. And they're saying it's moving towards Siberia, 50 kilometres per year. From, um, I think, the 17th century, it's moved 2,000 kilometres, but you'd have to check that figure on... I know it's 2,000 kilometres, but I don't know precisely on which length of time. I think I might know, actually. I'm just looking at my next note, 250 million years. They said that the last magnetic pole shift happened 780,000 years ago. And they say that the next one's due. We're actually overdue, they said. Now, in terms of the poles flipping like that, there's been 300 reversals in that 250 million years. Now, how do they know that? They actually can drill down into the ocean. They can go down 6,000 metres, 6 kilometres, and apparently there's magnetic fragments that they can actually pull up in a core sample and they can actually determine, isn't it fascinating, um, the amount of, it ha if there's been magnetic fluctuations. Now, around the Earth, we have um, these magnetic poles. They create a huge um, shield, magnetic shield around the Earth. And you can look on Google to see what it actually looks like. It's massive. And what it does is it protects the Earth from all this solar flare radiation, this particle radiation that is it's deflect, deflected from the Earth. So it's a protective shield. It's very interesting. And, of course, I learnt tonight that the, the sun has a magnetic shield as well. And 
what the issue is with this magnetic field is that the scientists are stating that it's decreasing in its strength. It's actually decreased 10%. And they consider that is how they can predict that it's readying itself for a magnetic field shift or a pole shift or a polar reversal. There's a few names for it where the magnetic north becomes south. So what they're saying is as that magnetic field weakens, imagine that it's bipolar, and they just mean bipolar is two poles. So it's quite strong. It's like a magnet, if you can imagine that. But as that field weakens, it actually starts to dance around, and they say that several poles um, are dancing whilst it's very weak. And then once it starts to strengthen again, the poles become more solid. So the south would be in the north and the north will be in the south. So they talked about the cosmic rays um, and how these rays, is, uh, there can be a loss of protection if the shield diminishes by 15%. They said uh, we become more vulnerable to the radiation with this, this weakening of the magnetic field, the shield. So cosmic rays hit the Earth and we just get a sort of a filtering of those rays through. They're charged particles from the sun is what they are. And what they're saying is there's quite a lot of disruption through the coronial eruptions which is the solar flare eruptions, that are quite large flare eruptions from the sun. It causes oscillations in the magnetic field. Now, because David Suzuki is from Canada, he's talked about a few events in Canada. So in 1994, there was solar activity, which damaged satellites, Canadian satellites. He talked about in 1989, electrical blackouts in Quebec. Western pipelines, oil and gas are sensitive to Earth's magnetic fields. It can overload the um, electrical system, which is interesting, um, and there can be spills. And they said more. They also talked about GPS and how we all have GPS. Well, if there's a massive solar activity, it can actually um, create inaccuracies in the calculations through GPS up to 100 metres. If they're really massive, it might knock out communications because we're now so electronic in our society. We're so dependent on electronics. There's also magnetic um, fields in the body. Um, magnetics of the planet have huge um, application on a variety of um, in a variety of ways. This particular um, documentary talked about astronauts as well when they're out into space they talked about light flashes from the sun and that the astronauts have to shield their eyes it, they say it's not a lot of particles just one and they've just got to be very careful so that's the cosmic rays they go to the international space station and they're actually investigating solar radiation there was also some scientists having a look at the, the solar radiation in, on planes. Uh, so you're up at 10,000 feet. You're obviously going to experience more uh, solar particle, uh, solar radiation up at 10,000 feet than you will on the surface of the Earth. They said it's 10 to 50 times higher than the ground. Now, as this magnetic field weakens, and this was the point that was being made, it may mean more intensification of solar radiation when you're up on a plane. Um, some planes around the equator may have to be cancelled around the equator. And what they said was that um, that's, that solar radiation is equivalent to an X-ray, which is interesting. So as the field weakens, the radiation increases. Another important factor with magnetic fields is wildlife. Obviously, there's a lot of migratory birds, there's turtles, there's you know, you've got the, um, the whales, the dolphins, all sensitive to magnetic fields, currents. I'm, I'm actually ad-libbing now. I'm just thinking about it. 
what they talked about was um, some of these turtles, for example, and, you know, may well travel quite long distances and may be disrupted by magnetic fields. So they wonder what will happen with the wandering of the magnetic fields because they're moving around so much. How does that affect migratory animals? Do they get lost? Do they get beached? Will they find the grounds where they need to go to, to nest? So there's, there's big questions around what's going to happen. And historically they've said that when there's been magnetic field changes, there's been climate change, and they say that they tend to mirror um, transition times. Although they, were, they did state at the end of the documentary not to worry in the sense of they don't believe there's mass extinction events occurring through magnetic reversals. But the scientists are trying to emulate these magnetic reversals to see what the impact is. They said that um, there was the fall of civilizations as a result of major events on the planet. Um, 3000 BC in ancient Egypt, there was major change, and 1000 AD with the Mayan civilization completely disappearing. So they're saying the variation in magnetic fields is linked to climate change. And of course, that's my theory of why things are looking pretty crazy at the moment. Weather is, I'm always conscious of the weather. So those cosmic rays are also impacting on clouds. Um, it's very, very interesting. The spreading of the light, um, they reckon, is greater than powerful solar winds, so cosmic rays. Those particle effects the clouds. Again, going back to the sun shield that I mentioned before, this is the magnetics, magnetic field around the sun. They say it's 100 times more powerful than the Earth's. However, it's also recorded as weakening as well, which suggests that this is a um, solar system shift. They talk also about human impact on climate change as warming the planet and the cosmic events calling it. And they wondered which would um, be, in the, be in the ascendancy, warming or cooling. They had the CERN Collider simulate increased uh, energy, cosmic radiation. Apparently, they're still waiting for the data to come in on that one. What I found interesting, too, is there was talk about the motion in the Earth's core. I didn't know. You see, I don't know a lot about it because I'm not a geologist. And that apparently moves the magnetic needle. So if you've got a, a compass, that, mag, that moving magnetic or earth core, iron core, is affecting, you know, the needle north-south. And they also make the point that they can't predict the reversal. Um, they don't know enough. But over 780,000 years since the last reversal, there's been significant change in our world. Yeah, the electronic circuitry, they say, is, is vulnerable to these cosmic rays. And the last point that they made was um, we, they believe that through these uh, huge changes, we have to rethink our place in the scheme of things. And I think that's a really nice note to finish on as well. That just gives you something to consider. Our world is going through great transition at this time. I personally am not afraid of the future. I don't fear change. And there's no point anyway because you're not in control. <laughs> you might as well enjoy life <laughs> no matter what happens. Let's just look upon it with curiosity and fascination. I'm certainly fascinated. I'm getting a lot of inspiration around it. I'm very interested to see um, what happens with the planet. I personally perceive and um, sense that the planet is a living organism. They call Earth Gaia. I think that's a very accurate depiction of what the Earth is. It's literally an organism. 
And I also come from a perspective where I see consciousness as permeating all life. So therefore, I see the planet as having its own form of consciousness and that there is a shift occurring. We humans sitting on the surface of the planet, we have a lot to rethink because our impact on the planet is affecting it. It's not enough to sort of um, individually segment off and say, oh, well, it's someone else's problem. It's actually not. The climate events is a global problem. It's not about each nation state looking out for its own interests. It's about all of them coming together and getting rid of the politics. We've got to stop the politics at the international level because it's actually becoming what I would see as a blockage to change, to real change. And that's because of economic interests and old paradigms still having undue influence on political processes rather than democratic processes uh, in democracies, of course, uh, in those countries that are not democracies. Let's hope they're not swayed to the same extent, but I sense that they're increasingly swayed um, as more and more become dependent on economics. The planet doesn't think in terms of economics. The planet thinks in terms of homeostasis, which means balance. The system doesn't favour one interest over another. It's actually interconnected. It actually thinks as one system. There are knock-on effects. When we interfere with the various balances, tipping points, when we affect the temperature, it has all sorts of implications for a very finely tuned system that's really calibrated itself over six billion years, if not more. See, we even think, what is it? Um, we even think that that's an accurate figure. How do we know? Is that true? Maybe it's older. Certainly six billion people on the planet all aspiring to live like the United States. And as I've stipulated before in some of my videos, we would need another four Earths for that to be realised. Given that we don't have four Earths on hand, <laughs> and yes, we have already traversed out into the space and Mars and, Earth and the Moon, um, certainly send out probes to have a look at possible places we can relocate. <laughs> it's not like moving your house. <laughs> You've got to adjust to different planets and they're not the same as this jewel that we call Earth. Um, some of them are rocks that have no life forms on them, although there's been signs of life forms. So it'd be interesting to know what wiped out those life forms, particularly on Mars. So I just think that we need to actually um, work with our own planet first and our own species and we have to look at where we're out of step with natural systems. We have to start to think like the planet if we're to come into homeostasis. So from um, a peace perspective, we need to become equal with one another, no longer exploiting people in other nations, we have to start to see the world as one, one civilization. We share with family, which is every civilization, every race on the planet. We start to bring back some ancient notions of honoring species that we depend upon and utilizing them for our need, not our want. To, sh to shift um, exchanges from economic profit maximization and what I've suggested in the past is gross national happiness because I believe once we're happy and I'm not just talking about you know fulfilling pleasures I'm talking about joy from within coming into alignment with truth within and that truth means that we are living life from within and I see that as a calibration with higher intelligence, whatever you conceive that to be. Because I see that consciousness already in harmony with the natural order. And so that means then that we're not reaching out for material things to fill gaps within ourselves, but we're, we're developing community uh, into a more advanced civilization that has very sophisticated um, social understanding 
that favours emotional intelligence, that no longer has gender imbalance, which actually imbalances the planet, I might add, where we place children at centre. They're no longer on the periphery of an economic system, but we're actually here to, to um, create a better world for them. So they need to have balanced families. They need to feel loved. We need to learn how to grow plants so that we can live and animal husbandry. The permaculture process is probably one of the best that I've seen, which Bill Mollison here in Australia created, which is a form of companion planning. It harmonises with natural systems. So anything that is in harmony with the natural systems is going to be sustainable in a real way in the future. Our toxic thoughts create the toxic world we're in. The negativity and the greed, self-interest, is not in favour of natural selection on the planet. So there has to be a lot of work done on educating children uh, in universal values is what I typically talk about. Uh, the ones that I've done is real hope, responsibility, empathy, awareness, love, honesty, oneness, peace, enjoyment, and service. So that's real hopes. So what I see that as is real is in many respects reflecting authenticity. So when you're authentic, you'll be responsible, you're able to respond, you'll feel empathy with other people, you won't just be self-interested, you'll actually be meeting in the middle with others. Conflict resolution reflects that. Awareness, you start to notice what's going on around you, you're not busying yourself, distracting yourself, you know, from the reality that you're in. You're actually looking at things really honestly and you're facing all fear and overcoming it. That's called transmutation. That's how we grow. That's how we live frequency. So that's awareness. We start to expand our awareness of our place in the cosmos is another way. Love, of course, is very central to all of this. The whole planet is a loving, uh, vibrating energy in itself of homeostasis. Um, there's also that sense of vibrational oneness, that the planet's vibrating as one anyway. So what love is, is we see ourselves in each other. We care about each other. So when people are starving, we don't just say, oh, well, that's just them. We actively participate in our world to ensure some balance and we assist the people. Now, often people talk about population issues. Yes, there's massive population issues with the size of it. But who's to play God here and say who can stay and who can't? Um, I don't actually believe in that. I believe there is natural order that's far more intelligent than we are. But what I would say is we need to educate women, and this is where the equality comes in, where women can make more choices around whether they have children or not. Often women think that children will complete them. I've not had children and I'm complete, so it's not a necessary thing. We don't have to have children to be happy. You can be happy without children. And if having less population creates a happier civilization, well, I think that's a responsible choice to make. We have to look at the amount of resources per person that we're utilizing and looking at the first world, second world, third world at this point. We have to move somehow towards minimizing our waste. So living uh, at the level of need, not want. Want is a marketed thing where we're generating more wants and as a result of that we're undermining support systems on the planet. That's where the CO2 is going up into the atmosphere and melting the ice caps affecting the axis and magnetic fields. So you might want to think about that. <laughs> it's not really about the environmentalist versus the industrialist, it's actually about do we want the magnetic field to minimise to a point of it flipping, which, which I think it will anyway regardless of what you <laughs> What you do is <laughs> probably more important to look at do we want the ice caps melting and what impact will that have on the uh, North Atlantic conveyor where the waters are moving from the north to the south from hot to cold in a conveyor like pattern which keeps the, the oceans alive when all that ice melts what's going to happen to the conveyor does it stop and then UK goes into an ice age you know this fundamental things we've really got to seriously think through. <laughs> All the pollutants going up into the atmosphere, every single industrialist just, you know, pumps it out into the atmosphere, not taking responsibility for the global commons, 
seeing themselves as part of nation state. If you're in the US, you're looking at the EPA. You know, here in Australia, looking at emissions. These are all regulated by government, but we're not a global regulator. We're all separated. And that's one of the serious problems on our planet right now is that we haven't come together as one. And until we do, um, these problems will escalate. And people might say, well, we can't change anything anyway. Well, we don't know. What I would say to people is until you come into a peaceful consciousness and you tap into a universal consciousness of which the cosmos is, has emanated from, and we too have come from uh, something that has manifested creation. Definitely we're looking at an, an expansion in the universe, things have evolved, things have been created. This is the truth of the matter. It's very wise to know that you don't know. If you don't know that you don't know, that is ignorance. And once we really anchor into the idea that we know that we don't know, then we open up to possibilities. And that's the power of that type of acknowledgement. So I think I've done a very lengthy video on this topic. I've just had inspiration coming, which is why that went on a bit longer. But I hope it's given you a sense of our interconnectedness with the, the world, with Gaia, and that we all have a responsibility to create homeostasis within ourselves between each other and with the planet. And that, in my view, is the true sustainability, which is embedded in gross national happiness as more of a reflection of inner truth being lived in the world. So I'll leave that with you. And if you want to look at any of the work that I've done, you can go to my website on www.worldpeacefull.com. And that's to empower children into a peaceful philosophy, very welcoming of any investors who want to assist me with this work. The other website is biz.worldpeaceful.com and that's to do with um, workplaces and to bring in well-being and start to address the bullying issues which comes from power imbalances. Once we feel inner security, the outer world will become more secure for us. All power issues come from powerlessness insecurity and what we would call an egoic consciousness and as we shift from that into more selfless um, and interconnected consciousness that we are all one indeed our planet will change as as indeed we will as well so with that i send you homeostasis <laughs> peace love truth and a celebration that we will come into alignment with earth changes. Thanks. Bye.